Fireside Chat kicks off our third season as we look at some of the offseason moves the Flames made. We'll look at who we think will make the team in each position, talk about the Young Stars Tournament in Penticton, and we'll look ahead to training camp. This is episode 52, Training Camp Preview, recorded September 18th, 2014. Are you ready? See you red. It's time for another episode of Fireside Chat. Thank you, Beasley. And with those familiar guitar chords, we are back for the third season of Fireside Chat. I'm Dan, alongside, as always, my co-host, Matt. How was your summer, Matt? Awesome. Been working out a lot this uh, summer, getting in shape, so, you know. That's always important. It's so it's like you're you've been doing what the Flames have been doing, working out all summer, getting themselves in shape, and you're ready for hockey season now too. Yep, it's all good. Nice. Well, Matt, we're back for another season. Uh, training camp is just around the corner, so we figured we should probably do our uh, very first show of the season, talking about what's gone on in the off season and what we can expect from the training camp. Sounds good. So Flames made a lot of moves this offseason, um, namely bringing in some big free agents, which we covered in our last episode um, at the tra- at the uh, UFA opening. They brought in uh, Jonas Hiller as a goaltender. They brought in Derek England. They brought in uh, Mason Raymond. Those were their big three. But they've also made some other signings this summer. Um, they brought in Devin Setaguchi, Corey Potter, there's a lot of new faces on this team, and I, we had we talked at the end of last season about how bare are these cupboards, and as I look down the roster now, I'm seeing a very different Flames team. Why don't we talk for a bit about what we think is depth or weaknesses in certain positions, and let's start from the back out. How do you think the Flames are looking to net this year with uh, Hill or Ramo pairing? Oh, it's a very solid 1A, 1B pairing uh, you know Hiller and Ramo they're not top 10 goaltenders in the NHL uh, but you you know they're solid starters and you need that you know if one guy's struggling then you have somebody that's qualified at least to come in and relieve him if you know say like Hiller starts off really bad you know you got Ramo right there and then in Ab- Adirondack, that's going to take me a while to correct myself, uh, you got Ordeo, who also looks quite ready. So, you know, if injuries happen or if both of them struggle, you have a good quality third option as well. Do you think it's a given that we see Ordeo start the season off in Adirondack? I would guess so, unless one of the two goalies gets hurt. But, you know, during the season, anything can happen. So, you know, like if Ordeo plays lights out, he might get called up. If not, likely he'll be in the NHL next year. When I look in the net, I think that we're much stronger than we were this time last year. I mean, last year we really had some unknown goaltenders. We had Joey McDonald, who we all know was not an NHL starter. We had Kerry Ramo, who was coming back to North America for the first time in a number of years. And then they had... Another goaltender that no one ever heard of, who is no longer a goaltender here, Red Obara, who we ended up winning the job in the end. I think this year having Jonas Hiller, who is coming off a bad year, he's going to have things to prove to everybody. Um, I think having him, and I think he's going to win the starter job, in net is going to give a lot more confidence to these players. He's not Kippersoft by any means, but I believe that Hiller is an NHL starter. And it's going to give Ramo somebody to learn from and push Ramo a little bit to be a better goaltender. Yeah, and competition is key. You know, you get the better results if you have somebody that's actually there with you. Because if you have nobody there, then even if you suck, then, you know, well, you're still the best option. So if Hiller and Ramo can bounce off of each other, that'll solidify the goaltending position readily. And it seemed last year like Ramo did best when he had competition. Once Barra came up and kind of won the starter job for a little bit, when we saw Ramo back in the second half of the season, he seemed a lot better. And I don't know if maybe he was just feeling the North American game better or if the competition pushed him, but whatever it was, I was really happy with what we saw from Ramo in the second half last year. 
Yeah, at, at the beginning of the season, Ramo didn't even look like a qualified NHL starting goaltender, let alone anything to write home about. But as you said, once Barra stepped his game up and proved to be competent as well, Ramo's play elevated significantly to the point where he was indispensable towards the end of the season. Yeah, I totally agree with you. Do you think that Jonas Hiller will be the starter this year? Do you think we're going to have a 1A, 1B? How do you think it's going to shake down? I would probably expect that it'll likely be Hiller in the 1A, but that for the first 20 or so games that each goalie will get playing time to see who's actually doing well, and then moving forward, you know, it'll probably end up like one goalie playing 50 games and the other guy playing 30. Yeah, and I think the nice thing is, I mean, this team is still a rebuilding team, so you you don't have to overplay one goaltender, like some might argue we did with Kipper for a few years. If one guy's not feeling well or one guy's on a drought, sit him down, put the other guy in, and if you really have to, put one guy in the press box and bring Ordeo up. Yeah, it, you know, it, there isn't the same kind of lack of talent that we had when Kipper was the goalie like you know it when you got a guy like say McElhenney who gives extremely inconsistent efforts you know you're kind of (laughs) stuck you know and you gotta play Kipper because you know you can't have somebody that's that big of a question mark in net so at least now they got two guys that are more or less equal and you know just got to ride the hot hand. When I look around the league at rosters going into training camp right now, I think as far as a tandem goes, the Flames might actually have one of the best tandems in the league this year. Yeah, they might not necessarily have the better starting goaltender, but they definitely have one of the top backups. Yeah. and that, Whichever way you label them. Exactly. So I think that, you know... Having two two good goalies sometimes can be better than having one really hot goalie and one really crappy goalie. So I'm really looking forward to seeing what happens in net. Mm-hmm. It'll be interesting to watch, for sure. There's also been some changes on the on the blue line for this team. Uh, the biggest one is the Butler's out and Derek England comes in. But the Flames have also signed Corey Potter, a uh, former Oiler, former Bruin, to, this, to the lineup. Um... Overall, I know some people last year were concerned about the Flames' blue line and not having enough top-line blue liners. What do you think it looks like right now? Well, the Flames didn't really improve their top end of their defense core, but realistically, the top three with Giordano, Weidman, and Brody is quite solid. And Russell and Smead make a very good number four or five guys, so... You know, and upgrading Butler to England definitely helps in the toughness department. You know, because Butler was not exactly a physical defender. And that, I believe, was one of the things that the Flames were lacking a bit last year. So, you know, it overall it's improved, but not by leaps and bounds. I think that if I look back at last year and my notes from last year... To me, the defense was one of the more interesting categories because I feel like we had more guys that made a big leap last year. I mean, Chris Russell, when he came to this team, I didn't expect much from him. He made huge leaps and bounds last year. I think he really became, in my mind, a bona fide top six guy. I think TJ Brody made big leaps and bounds last year. I think Ladislav Smeed played a bigger role on this team than I expected him to. Maybe it's because of lack of depth. But I think if we can get the same kind of growth from these same six, seven guys again this year, the Flames are going to look even better on the blue line. Yeah, and for once, the defense isn't actually looking to be a weakness for the Flames. And, you know, because like if any of those guys get hurt, you have guys like Watherspoon and Sealoff that could step in, in addition to a few of the tryout guys that we've invited that you know we'll be discussing later on. Now, Corey Potter's been signed to a two-way deal. He's a, se- well, I guess, seasoned NHLer. He's been around the league for a number of years. Um, 
he is on two way. He could go back and forth. Do you think that the Flames will carry Potter as the seventh defenseman for most of the year in Calgary? Uh, I think he'll mainly uh, replace Chad Billens as the offensive catalyst in Adirondack and be the first call up if necessary. I don't. I don't really see the Flames carrying seven defensemen unless they sign one of the tryout guys. Because the, th- the thing with Potter is even though it's two-way, he's going to have to clear waivers. And at certain points of the season, I'm not sure we could sneak him through waivers. I it, With Potter, he's not good enough to really worry about that too much. It, like, it, you know, it, if you lose him on waivers, it does hurt, but it's not like the end of the world. So... He's replaceable, is what I'm getting at. Okay, I think I agree with you that this year I think our defense is not a liability for the team. I think they have a strong defensive core for a rebuilding team. I like it. Um, our defense is mostly NHL veterans at this point. I don't, to me, and we'll talk more about this later, but I don't see any of the rookies cracking the lineup full-time this year, which I think is fine. Let's give them some more seasoning time. But I like the, you know, the Brody Giordano. I think Giordano had a great season last year, and if he can build on that, I like Smead and Russell as a as the other top four. Weidman, a lot of people have had question marks about for over a season now. Do you still think Weidman can be a valuable member of this team this year? Yeah, we need we do need somebody to score goals on the defense, and he does do that well. So, you know, I don't see why. He wouldn't be a valuable asset. He wouldn't be, like, if a trade came up, he wouldn't be somebody that I'd, you know, absolutely must keep this guy, but... I think Weidman gets a bad rap online, maybe more than he deserves. I think he's a capable NHL guy. I think for our team where we are, he's a capable top four. I agree with you. If a good trade comes up, trade him. But I, I personally like Dennis Weidman. I think it's not like we, yes, he might be overpaid a little bit, but we've got tons of cap room. I see no reason not to keep this guy in a top four position. Yeah, exactly. You need somebody to fill out the roster. And it's not like we have a bunch of kids that are ready right this second to take on his power play quarterback position. So I don't see why there would be a rush to get rid of him anyway. I would rather keep a Weidman on the roster and give other guys a chance to develop than, say, get rid of a Weidman for nothing and bring up, say, a Mark Kandari into, you know, the last top six or seven role. Yeah. Uh, no point <laughs> right now. A year or two from now, that's a different question. For but sure. For now, eh, it's fine. So let's move to the forwards. Um, I think the mo- there's been a lot of change in the forward ranks, but still a lot of it stays the same. Um, you know, we, we've now seen Mason Raymond join the team. We're seeing David Wolf joining the team this year. Uh, Devin Setaguchi. I think that the forward ranks are where we're going to see some young players emerge. I think Monahan is going to have another good year. Um, but we've also got you know guys in there like Bolig who is just going to be another grinder. So different r- different direction for the Flames this year. It seems like they're going more for the toughness. What are your thoughts on the forward ranks of this team? Well, the Flames offensively are probably quite a bit weaker than even last year. Losing both Camilleri and Stempniak and only replacing them with Mason Raymond and Devin Setaguchi is not really gonna balance out the goal scoring that much but that being said it it does allow for say Marcus Granlin, Sven Berchi, Johnny Gaudreau, Sam Bennett possibly those guys to possibly make the team as well so you know it it's one of those things that it, as the season progresses, you might see guys falling out of the lineup, like a guy like David Jones, and allowing the younger players to come in and see what they've got. You know, it's funny you mentioned David Jones. I was looking at uh, the Flames roster today, and I saw David Jones on there, and I forgot this guy was even a Flame. I mean, he played. He hard, he didn't play many games last year. He didn't look good in many of the games he played last year. Is David Jones healthy and ready to go? I, as far as I know, he is, but 
the... He looked good at the beginning of last season, and then he got hurt like a few games into the season and just never seemed to recuperate from that. If he returns to playing the way he did at the beginning of last year, then he'll likely be a good player for the Flames this season. If not, then you've basically got a $4 million cap hit that might be sliding in the press box. How many years has Jones got left on his deal? I think think it's done either this year or next year either way it, it, you know it's fine for where we're at right now it's not a problem if it you know if we were in contender mode then we probably would have bought him out if we're in contender mode a lot of things would be different on this roster so david jones has got uh, two years left on the deal this year and next year both at four million to, to me, I think that the forward ranks are, as you said, they're missing a lot of firepower they had last year. I mean, losing Camilleri is a huge hit to this team. Um, but I think it allows us to bring in some emerging players and really let them play a different role. I think it might let Sean Monaghan slot into the number one offensive role that arguably he was or wasn't last year playing with Camilleri. I think it's going to let a guy like Mason Raymond really show a different side of himself because he's going to get to be a number one guy perhaps. And I think it might let another player who they bring up, be it a Bennett or a Goudreau or somebody like that from the farm who might get a lot more playing time, especially on the special teams there because they are trying to shift guys around. Yeah. And the good thing with the rebuilding team is that really anybody over the age of 25, their job isn't cemented in for sure. Because who knows exactly what any of the kids will do. You know, like a guy like, say, Max Reinhardt, who's not really thought of as being an impact guy, he might come into camp and just blow the door off of things. You don't know until you get there. So, you know, lots of things to be interested and look at this year. There will be a lot of changes over the next year, year and a half on the roster, I believe. I think barring injuries, the forwards are where we're going to see the most movement this year. I think we're going to see guys come up, come down, guys get, you know, four games, five games here. I think they're going to try out a lot of different forwards on this roster. Yeah, I wouldn't be shocked if the Flames ended up playing 20 to 25 different forwards over the course of the year as injuries and changes happen so you know it'll be good another question mark i had on my list here is paul byron paul byron's a guy who's jumped between the flames and abbotsford since he got here he jumped between the sabers and the portland pirates in his year there Um, but at the end of the last year he came up to the flames and he looked really good do you think that paul byron has a shot at making a full-time nhl bid this year i hope so you know, from what he, how he performed, especially at the end of last year, he looked like an NHL player. Whether or not he comes into camp and blows the door off of things, who knows? It, you know, that'll definitely be one of the players that I'll be watching, especially during the preseason games here. Sure. I talked earlier about Chris Russell and the improvement we saw from him last year. A guy that really impressed me in the forward ranks last year was Joel Colborn. He came a lot further than I expected him to um, in the season last year. And I think Colborn can still get even better. Um, I don't think there's any doubt that he's going to be an NHL regular this year. But do you think that Colborn has what it takes to step up and perhaps fill some of what we lost with the departure of... um, I wouldn't say Camilleri, but maybe the departure of Stepniak? It's possible. He did grow significantly as the season wore on, and, you know, like, for the first 40, 50 games when he was a center, like, he didn't really look like he was going to stick in the NHL full-time, but once he got shifted over to the wing, he really seemed to find himself and if the flames continue to have him as a winger it, i had see no reason why it couldn't be a 30 to 40 point guy if not more we got 28 points last year so he's only two points away from a 30 point season yeah it it's one of those things that uh, 
over the next couple of years, we'll need to see, like, a put-up-or-shut-up season from guys. And Colborn is probably at the leading edge of that, where, you know, like, if he doesn't emerge as a solid second-line player, then, you know, he's got guys like Poirier, Klimchuk, this, that, you know, I can go through a list of ten names that are nipping at his heels. So, you know, it, it's one of those things that he pretty much needs to have a good season in order to remain aflame for the longer term. I agree. So when you look at the roster, the guys we just talked about, you look at some of the up-and-comers on this organization, the new draft picks, some of the guys that are going to be in the AHL, for years it was said that the Flames' cupboards are bare. What's your thought going into the 2014-2015 NHL season? Well, it depends on what position you're talking about. For goaltenders, the Flames are extremely deep with Ordeo, Gillies, and McDonald, all three of whom look fairly good. It amongst the forwards, like we're bursting at the seams with talent uh, amongst the forward ranks. Uh, there's at least 15 players that look good. I agree. There's a lot of good forwards this year. Um, I think that if you look at the number of guys the Flames brought in at the end of last year to even give them an NHL tryout, there's no doubt that there's some players on this roster that have promise. Kenny Agostino, Bill Arnold. Uh, Johnny Gaudreau, looking even down further on the roster, you got guys like Hanowski, um, Klimchuk. I think the Flames have really put a lot of effort into upgrading their forward ranks, and I, I think you can look down the roster and see tons of talented forwards there who I think are going to keep the Flames deep for a number of years. What about on the blue line? Um... On the blue line, it looks like a little bit of a black hole. With You've got guys like Seeloff, Watherspoon, Kulak, and Culkin, but none of those guys looks to be, for sure, NHL top four defensemen. And that's kind of worrying because, you know, the Flames do have a fairly decent defense core right now, but you always want younger talent to come in. And right now, none of the players that we have look to be for sure locks to be top four defensemen, where amongst the forward ranks, we have plenty of guys that look to be top six forwards. So, you know, it's one of those areas that the Flames definitely need to address in the draft this upcoming season. And... Thankfully, there are quite a number of good defensemen this year, so if the Flames aren't picking McDavid or Eichel, there's definitely a few guys that they could select that would definitely help to address this little bit of a problem right now. <laughs> See, and I think you you can't address everything all at once. I think the Flames have done a great job of addressing their forward depth, and I'd even say their goaltending depth. Guys like Mason McDonald, um, you know, some of the younger goaltenders they have, I think are great players um, that they've worked on over a number of years to make sure they're improving on those. You know, Yoni Ordeo was a draft pick. I think now it's time for the Flames to say we have four depth. We've got good depth in net. Let's go out. Let's start working on the blue line. Yeah, and the thing is, is that it's not really that worrying of a problem. Like, Giordano's only 30. Smeed's, I think, 27 or 28. Uh, Russell's 26. Brody's 22. So, you know, that's four of your six spots taken by guys that are under the age of 31. So it's not a, oh, we're screwed right now problem. The oldest it's two just... defensemen are Dennis Weidman, who's 31, and Derek England, who's 32. Yeah, so it's not a problem right now. It's just as we move forward, we're going to need basically like our version of Keith and Seabrook from Chicago. And while Brody might be one of those guys, we need a second really good young defenseman as well. And, you know, that just comes with time and draft picks. Well, and being in a rebuild, we have the time it's going to take. It's not like we need to be a contender this year or next year. We have the time, in my mind anyways, we have the time to go out and find those 
those defensemen, bring them into the system, and get them moving through the system. And there's no rush to do that. We've got three, four years to find those key pieces. Yeah. That's why I'm kind of hoping the Flames are picking third or fourth at, it, at the draft this year. So that way, like, we can get Hannafin or Kylington. Because, you know, each of those guys looks like a really exceptional top pairing defenseman. So, you know, if we miss out on Eichel and McDavid, at least there's a top-notch defender right behind them. And in a way, it might almost be better that we don't have the one-two picks because we'd almost be forced to use them on those two guys when maybe what we really need is a defenseman. Maybe we have the Oilers problem or we've got a lot of forwards and we just need to take a defenseman. Well, if you get McDavid or Eichel, honestly, you take them and then you trade one of the litany of other forwards that we have and (laughs) address it that way. Like, honestly, if it came to that, you'd trade someone like a backland for a good young defenseman instead. Because, you know, anytime you get a franchise guy, like, look at Colorado. Apparently the Flames offered the all three of our first round picks in the 2013 draft for McKinnon. And, you know, I right now I wouldn't make that trade if I was Colorado. No. So. So, Matt, when we look at the roster right now compared to where it is last year, um, it still looks like a rebuild roster to me. Does it look look that way to you? Oh, yeah. The, the Flames are going to have a very long season. And, you know, like last year, pretty much everything went right. And, you know, we still finished fourth last. <laughs> so... You know, I don't see the Flames improving too much, especially after losing their best scorer. So, it's going to be tough. But, you know, there's a a lot to look forward to. Like, if you don't pay attention to wins and losses and, like, just assume that the Flames are missing the playoffs, then you can look forward to the emergence of all the younger players as they're coming up and developing i've heard from a couple people and i i'm not on this wavelength but i've heard from a couple people that this might be a playoff team this year i think we're far from it what do you think honestly i'd be somewhat shocked if we finished with more points than we did last year like it it could happen but you know i you, you look at all the other teams in the nhl and their rosters and the only one that's definitively worse than the flames is buffalo so you know like unless there's a severe tank job by several teams then you know like i don't see the flames really competing that much for a playoff spot and you know for a team that's fourth last last year we had a hell of a rally around that team. I mean, everyone in the city got so excited about the team and thought they had such a great season. So if we can keep looking at those positives, you know what? We had a bad standing, but we got great performances for what we needed out of a lot of the guys in our team. I think we can have just as much excitement and enthusiasm this year with a similar finish. Yeah, well, the thing is uh, that's different from last year to years prior is the level of work ethic. You know, like, the Flames, I believe, had the NHL record for most one-goal games in the course of a season. And you only do that if you've got hard work, so that way you're not going to get blown out every game. And Even though, looking at the rosters, really the Flames should have been blown out quite often by the opposition, yet they fought to keep in games. And they only had one stretch right around Christmas where they had any struggles that were consistent for any period of time, and that was only like a week and a half's worth of struggles. So, you know, if they keep that up, that'll be good. You know, but it remains to be seen I'm hoping that they could keep up that kind of work ethic, though. If we could have got that kind of work ethic from some of the rosters this team has put out in the last three or four years, I think the Flames could have had a lot more playoff appearances. Well, ever since you go back 
to like 05, 06, the Flames have always uh, underperformed the on paper team. And like you remember that the, the last playoff appearance the Flames had, like they at, in February, they were, were, had the division lead by like 13 points on Vancouver and ended up losing it. Like if they worked hard as they do now, like that team probably would have been either first or second in the conference instead of fifth. So, you know, then it's good to that they're working at instilling these good habits of hard work, which will pay dividends as the Monahans, Gaudreaux, Berchies, Bennetts mature. And, you know, hopefully the, in three or so years, the Flames will actually be a playoff team and emerge as a future contender. I, I think that there's no question that if they keep going with the same trajectory they're on now, that's going to happen. So let's uh, shift gears for a bit and talk about some of the new faces on this team this year. Um or at least some of the new faces that we might see on the team that we didn't talk about in our last episode. Um, one of the picks that I actually thought was, or not one of the picks, one of the signings that I thought was kind of surprising was Devin Setaguchi. And if you think about this in terms of what's given up, what's brought in, it's almost like a trade with Winnipeg. TJ Galliardi for Devin Setaguchi. Galliardi became a free agent. Winnipeg signed him. Setaguchi was with Winnipeg, became a free agent. The Flames brought Setaguchi in. I actually like the signing. Devin Setaguchi is a guy that when I looked around July 1st and saw he wasn't signed, I thought, you know what, he could play that TJ Galliardi style role here. The older guy, the veteran, the guy who we can put out with some younger guys, but who knows how the game is played. And I think a lot like Yanni Ordeo, or not uh, Yanni Ordeo, Jonas Hiller, he needs to rebound. He has some approved this year, so we might get a great season out of him. What do you think about Setaguchi? Well, uh, this was probably his last NHL season if he doesn't have a good year. Uh, You know, it's one of those things where he's going to likely end up being a KHL All-Star if he disappoints because you can't have a 20-point season and expect to remain an NHL player when you're an offensive player. And, you know, I'm hoping that Setaguchi rebounds and has a solid season, but that'll be up to him, really. And Last season he had 27 points, and as you said, Winnipeg did look at him as an offensive player. Do you think there is a, a chance, though, for him to kind of reinvent himself here, become more of a two-way forward or more of a defensive forward, perhaps? And from what I've watched of him, he's pretty much a one-way type guy. That's what I've seen, too. And a work ethic is a little bit inconsistent with him. That being said, you know, players can change. It's just that it will depend on what he brings on the ice and... Well, as you said, this could be his last run in the NHL. He is on a one-year deal. The Flames only brought him in for one year, and it's seven hundred fifty thousand. So even if he stinks up the dome, seven hundred fifty thousand is easy to waive and send down to the farm. Exactly, and he would pretty much be my number one candidate as being a replaced player as the season goes on. If he does struggle, then that. You know, it would be disappointing for us and him. And, as you said, it's one year. So, if he does stink, oh well. If he's good, you look at possibly bringing him back or flipping him at the trade deadline. To me, I would keep Devin Setaguchi in the NHL unless he loses that spot, and I'd make him the 13th forward. I think he's got, he doesn't need to be a top player for the Flames all year, but I think even in that 13th forward role, he can slot in when there is an injury and play enough quality minutes still to get us out of a jam and at 750,000 that's where I'd want to pay my 13th forward exactly and he's replaceable at that cost like especially like if say Reinhardt or insert the name of any of our AHL guys like tears it up this year 
and needs to be in the NHL, then, you know, he will be the first guy that I would assume would get replaced. I think that Setaguchi, and I, I don't know if coaches and GMs think this way, but I think he's almost going to be the bar. You've got to be better than this guy to get a job on the team. This is our 13th forward. If you want to be the 13th forward, you've got to be better than this guy. Exactly. So, you know, I think wherever Setaguchi plays... Or whoever that 13th forward is, I'm assuming it's going to be Setaguchi. This is the guy you have to beat. And I think that's going to set a precedence going into camp, too. Yeah, and competition definitely is important. And having qualified guys to compete against, it definitely helps. And having Setaguchi there, he is a qualified, legit NHL player. So... The bear cheese and such, they know that they do have to be better than this Yeah. if they want to stick. And even if they go to the AHL, they will go knowing that that's the marker for being an NHL player and they have to elevate themselves to that level and surpass it. And you know what? Devin Setaguchi got 27 points both the last two years, which for a team that's rebuilding... 27 points wouldn't be bad to have even as a full-time position if they want to slot him as a third-line winger. You know, it's not like he's got two points the last two years. 27 points is still a good offensive production from a bottom six guy. Yeah, he's not incompetent offensively. Like It's not like you're throwing uh, Westgarth or something into an offensive role and say, have at it. Yeah. <laughs> you know? No, for sure. We talked about Corey Potter earlier. Um, I think the Flames will carry seven defensemen, and if they do, I think Potter will be that seventh defenseman. If they carry six, I think Potter is a great AHL addition. Um, I agree with you. He's not probably the first teams might pick up on waivers, but I think at different times of the season, depending on injuries and that sort of thing, he could get picked up. Yeah, he's a useful guy. Like, he don't is. get me wrong. Yeah. It's just, it's not the end of the world. Either way, <laughs> so... And I think for the first time in a while, we've actually seen the Flames hand out quite a number of uh, professional tryout contracts, bringing guys into camp who they don't have signed, and guys who they're... veteran guys who they're trying to make win a contract. What are your thoughts about bringing veteran guys in on a tryout deal at camp? I know some people are really into it, some people don't like it. What do you think, Matt? Well, with the Flames' lack of defensive depth, in especially in the prospect base... It definitely helps to have guys like Sheldon Brookbank, Raphael Diaz, and Nolan Yonkman getting tryouts because they're all decent defensemen. Like, I wouldn't say they're good, but they would be a good seventh defenseman. And I'd actually consider all three of those guys as probably a better seventh defenseman then Corey Potter just because they do bring that physical element where Potter doesn't really so yeah it it's one of those things where if one of those guys can win a spot it would be good just to have the added depth if not well at least you tried <laughs> that's exactly how I look at it we're not offering these guys a contract they're not going to take one of our 50 contracts they're trying out for an NHL spot just the same as Kandari is just the same as any of our defensemen are. Um, and if they win one, because they're the best defensemen, I'm totally fine with that. If they don't win one and, you know, Kulak or Ramage or Seeloff get it instead, I'm totally fine with that too. I don't care if you're young or old. I just want the best players on this team. And if Exactly. And even if we sign one of these guys, if we bring in, you know, a Nolan Yonkman and throw him in the AHL to put some veteran experience down there and, you know, help patrol the blue line, I'm good with that too. But to me, win the job. Like, I, lo I like that they're bringing in um, veterans because I think the more veterans you have on the ice and in the dressing room, the more you have for young players to emulate, to say, this guy's what I need both on the ice and off the ice. This is what it takes to be an NHL player. Yeah, and you need veteran guys to facilitate the younger players' development as well. Like if say like you're a defenseman and you're trying to pass the puck up, right? And 
you've got nobody to pass it to, well, you're kind of screwed, and, like, that will stunt your development because you're not being able to do your job correctly. But if you got a veteran guy there with you that can receive the pass and so on, well, then that helps because you've had a successful play develop and, you know, you're not having to get out of position to cover the other guy. And, you know, veterans do help in that regard. So, like, it, with Brookbank, Diaz, and Yonkman, as well as Potter, if you have them and you sign one to an AHL contract, and have them in Adirondack, that also helps. Because if injuries do creep up, then you've got somebody on the farm that can come up and spell the injury and, you know, not look out of place. Yeah, and, and like I said, I like the idea of bringing in veterans. I figure, you know what, if your young guys can't get the job done, have some veterans there, but also have veterans there to say, just like we said with Setaguchi, these guys were in the NHL. These are the guys that I have to be or beat to get that job. Exactly. Now, I would not pay, like, for example, Rafael Diaz made over a million dollars last year. I don't think I would pay him that even if he gets a contract out of training camp. I think there's a reason that he's probably unsigned still. But if we can sign Brookbank, Diaz, Trevor Gillies, or Nolan Yonkman, any of the four guys they brought in on a tryout agreement to under a million dollars, without it costing us a young player's contract, I'd say go ahead and do it. If any one of them impressed us that much, let's do it. Yeah, exactly. It, it, you know, if they're good enough to play, go for it. And I think, like you said with the farm, it could almost open up some spots too. I mean, you could look at a guy like... Mark Kandari, who I think is almost at his last chance with the Flames at this point. And if there's another team that want to take him off our hands for a low-round draft pick, I'd say move a guy like Kandari, bring a guy like Gillies or Yonkman into his place. Yeah, or you'd likely see like a Mitch Wall-type trade where you're trading him for a different AHL guy in a different position just to... Or like what uh, Greg Nemus for West Garth yeah, or something, something like, that. like that. So yeah, I'd be totally cool with either one of those. Yeah, options is always a good thing. They are, and having it, you know, it, it's worse when you have no options and you're stuck with a guy that's not good. Well, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> so if you can get quality depth, that's all good. The last two guys that I wanted to highlight, there's a bunch of guys that are here on training, on walk-on agreements at uh, training camp, but two guys that you and I talked about in our last episode of last year, um, after the rookie camp that they did, were two of the walk-ons there, Doug Carr, a goaltender who we liked, and Jason Fram, a defenseman who we both liked. Neither one of them are Flames property. They're both invited to camp. I think both of those guys, based on what we saw, deserve the invite. Um, if anyone wants to hear our in-depth analysis of both of those guys, I'd say go back to the last episode. But do you still think that Carr and Fram both deserve the tryout? Carr, for sure. He looked really good even uh, he looked better yesterday. better than Mason McDonald at some points. Yeah, well, yesterday he played in uh, uh, against the Dinos, and he looked quality, like a quality goaltender. Like, there was nothing about him that said that, like, you know, if he was one of our drafted guys, you would think that he was perfectly acceptable, so I don't see any reason why we wouldn't sign him, even if it is only to an AHL contract. Jason Fram, though, he has really good offensive instincts, but some of his defensive decision-making is quite poor, and that wasn't really readily apparent until the last week's games, uh, both at the rookie tournament and at against the Dinos. Some of the decisions he was making, especially against the Dinos, were glaringly bad. Like Anders Eriksson level, what are you doing? <laughs> so Do you think you know, that's something get... that can be coached, though? Yeah, it... <laughs> It would take some time, but 
it'd be worth seeing how he does this season. Like, I wouldn't... I would actually go away from my previous statement of actually signing him. I would see how he does this year in juniors and possibly use a seventh round draft pick type of thing like we did with Austin Carroll and see if he does make progress defensively. It, it His offensive instincts are good. Like, you, don't get me wrong. He's a very good offensive defenseman. It's just... That defensive decision-making, especially when you're an undersized defenseman, that can really screw you pretty good. So, you know, it, I'd, I'd wait and see. Yeah, I think Jason Fram, as you said, has some holes in his game. I don't know if he's ever going to be an NHL guy, but he's the kind of guy that might be a ECHL guy in an AHL call-up. At least to give him a shot, you know. Maybe the maybe the uh, Abbotsford Flames sign him, and we let them do what they want, whether they sign him to, you know, the ECHL team or what. But I think he's, he's definitely he earned his shot at the rookie camp, and now it's his to figure out what he's going to do with it and can he step up his game. Exactly, and as of right now, he still looks to be a little too raw to keep him. But it's one of those things that it can't hurt to... It, like, if they signed him, that'd be fine. If they didn't, that'd be fine. It can't hurt to give him the look as a walk-on player. Exactly. It's up to the player to show that he's worth keeping. Like, back in the day when Giordano was trying out, like, he looked good. Although he was still raw, but... You know, he he emerged, so you don't know exactly what you've got until, you know, time passes and then you can see. So going into, just as a note here, going into the training camp, the Flames have, I think, the largest training camp I can remember. 63 players will be attending camp. Six goalies, 21 defensemen, and 36 forwards. So that's a big group for these guys to evaluate. Well, it's a good thing, though. It is. Because uh, the Flames are pretty much wide open, and they need a lot of help in a lot of areas. So having more guys there to evaluate is actually a good thing. Worst case scenario is that they cut a whole bunch of guys. Camp has been started, and there's already been two cuts. Uh, Eric, Eric Roy, a defenseman, has gone back to his junior team, and Matt Mancina, a goaltender, has uh, also been cut. So they've still got six goalies. It's probably just a matter of how many do we need. You generally want to carry an, on, an even number of goalies because you're going to put two per team in camp. So that makes sense. Yeah. And while he injured his shoulder during uh, one of the rookie star games, so that's why he got sent back to juniors because it's going to be a two to three week injury if I recall correctly so So he'll be out for all the camp anyways yeah so there's no point it's not like he was going to make the NHL anyway so just go back to juniors so Matt um you did you watch any of the rookie tournament or the rookie tournament in Penticton yep and I also was at the Dinos game yesterday nice um, what did you What did you think of the rookie tournament? Who really stood out to you? Who impressed you from that tournament? Um, who perhaps disappointed you from that tournament? Well, I can go through the obvious names: Granlund, uh, Furland, Gaudreau, Bennett. They were all exceptional. So that you know, I don't need to no, talk th- too much about them. No, those are the guys them. that I accept, I expected to be exceptional too. Yeah, uh, Garnett Hathaway and. Um, McGee, well, I don't know who his first, what his first name is, but he was a walk-on guy. He, both of those guys were fairly impressive. Austin Carroll was impressive at times. Hunter Smith, he definitely mixed it up quite a bit. Offensively, Hunter Smith is a little bit behind the play, but you can see there's offensive skill there. He's more likely a three- to four-year guy, but definitely looks to be more NHL 
like a, more of a guaranteed NHL guy just due to his size and physicality. Whether his offensive game develops and he becomes a second, third line danger guy, or it, if he's more of a fourth line McGratton type physical guy it you know that's yet to be seen but what i like about smith though is he started to create an identity for himself there's so many of these guys i saw in the tournament who all look like each other and i didn't know who was who with it you know i had to look at the number he created that identity he wanted to be the rough and tumble player and you could tell he was going out and trying to do that and make that mark and and i agree with you he's i think he's definitely going to make the nhl but whether he becomes the next mcgratton or the next, you know, second line player on this team is up to him at this point, but he's leaving his options open. He's showing he can do a bit of both. Yeah. And his offensive abilities, like he was showing that there is something there, there. Like he's not just a rent a goon. So as this season and next season develop, you know, we'll begin to see whether he has legitimate offensive skill or if it's more likely that he'll be a third, fourth line banger type. Yeah. Which you need that too. So like it's, you know, it, it, you, you look at say like LA, like they had Jordan Nolan and a couple other guys that were just big physical mean presence on the third and fourth line. You need that. Well, especially the way we tend to like to build a team here in Calgary. We like those sandpaper players. And if he can get 20 points a year, even, you know, 10, 15 points a year and still be that rough and tumble guy, I think he's going to have a role here. Exactly. And you need that kind of physicality, especially in your lower lines. So that way, like if the other team is getting a little unruly, you, you have somebody there that can put a stop to it yeah yeah when i watched the tournament from what i saw anyways pretty much everybody performed the way i expected them to for me the biggest standout was hunter smith because i think he made a name for himself the guys that i expected you know the bennett goudreau those kind of guys to be great were great the guys i expected to not look as great were great he's the big guy that i think i went whoa there's some here that i didn't see before yeah, uh, he was the only surprise for me, really. Um, Morgan Klimchuk, he actually somewhat disappointed me, but he wasn't really put in an offensive situation. No, he wasn't. And he did score that uh, goal yesterday at the tournament. I, no, he didn't. He set it up, pardon me. He made a good pass. One of those things, one's wearing 52, the other one's wearing 62. Easy to mistake. <laughs> yep, for sure. But, um, anyone that disappointed you? Uh, most of the defense core, pretty much. And a few of the lesser important forwards. I think the guy that I was expecting something from and was disappointed by, I mean, like you said, the defense core... None of these guys are really top prospects, so I wasn't expecting a lot there. But Mason McDonald, I hoped, would rebound after what we saw at the rookie camp, and he didn't. And I was disappointed by that. I thought that Doug Carr was a better-looking goalie. Some of the you know tryout guys were better-looking goalies throughout, throughout the tournament. I think that Mason Raymond there's, or Mason McDonald, there's something there. He's just he's not up to speed to the NHL level. I don't know what it is. Well, he did make a bit of an adjustment like in the first game he started he allowed a, quite a few ugly goals yeah and i watched the whole first game they started in penticton yeah and, but against vancouver he looked fine like he let in a semi bad goal but he rebounded from that and yesterday he actually looked quite good so it's one of those things that it Yesterday it, he was playing it, the Dinos too, though. I mean, nothing against the Dinos, but that's a lot different than an NHL, you know, prospect squad. True. It he has to adjust how he reacts to plays. Like positionally, I found that he's very sound, but his reaction time to shots has allowed a lot to go in that normally you wouldn't see, and that's just a matter of getting used to quicker shots coming at you like if you're 
used to players shooting at like 70 miles an hour and you save those readily and then you're getting a whole bunch of shots that are coming at you 90 miles an hour well that's a whole different thing and it it's not that much of an adjustment but it is an adjustment and thankfully he's only 18 so he's got a few years to get quicker but his positioning is very solid so and that's usually the problem with young goaltenders is their positioning is bad so the fact that his is good that's the reaction time is less of a problem so yeah i i definitely think i'm not saying he's a boss by any means but i'm just saying that i guess from where he was drafted and what i was expecting from him I wasn't seeing it at camp, but I definitely think that there's some kinks in his game that need to be worked out. I think they can definitely work through them with him. We're not in any rush to get him up into the NHL anytime soon. So I think he's going to be a bit of a, a longer term project than maybe the team expected, but I definitely think that he's got some potential. Oh yeah. Anytime you have a goalie that's six foot four and is quick and good positionally, that's an extremely good place to start from. Other things like reaction times, that kind of thing, that's just a matter of getting more ice time against better competition. And that, you know, as he gets more playing time and the years go by, he should be able to make the adjustments necessary. He's a good prospect, it's just it's going to take a while. I hope that he can make those adjustments. I have faith he will, but you, all you can do is hope, right? Matt, is there anyone from, I guess, the rookie camp, if you will, from the Benticton tournament group who you think has a shot at making the NHL roster full-time this year? Anyone that, I mean, a lot of people have talked about Johnny Goudreau, uh, Sam Bennett, any of these guys, uh, Max Reinhardt, Granlin, who you think are really going to push the Flames to keep them in Calgary? If I had to pick one name on the list that I think will start the year in Calgary and remain in Calgary, it would be Marcus Granlund. I think he's done with the AHL entirely. He was that impressive to me. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. I think Granlund is, an, he's, I mean, he's 21, he's still fairly young, but I think he's looking like a guy who, in a rebuild, we want to give a chance to. And if he, again, if he stinks the place up, we can always send him back to Glens Falls. But I think, yeah, start him here, let him earn his roster spot. I really liked what I saw. He, he impre- I expect him to be one of the high-level players, but he did go above and beyond, I guess, what I was expecting. And I agree with you. I think he definitely has what it takes to be an NHLer this year on this roster. Yeah. Well, Gaudreau, he would be my second pick if I had to pick a second player. But I think he would be better off in Adirondack just for even a, a quarter to half a season just to get used to playing more regularly because being in college, like they only play a couple of times a week at usually uh, towards the weekends. And, you know, they only play 40 games versus 82. So getting used to the increased workload, that he'd probably be better served with that in the AHL. Just, you know, even if it's only till December even. I think as a small player too, the AHL is a good place to get his game elevated to the next level without necessarily bringing him to the NHL where there might be more guys trying to take liberties on him. Yeah, and you got to figure like with what Corrado did in headhunting him specifically, like I'm sure that other teams like if he's in the nhl to start the year like i wouldn't be shocked if a a whole host of teams started headhunting him just to why not (laughs) so you know if he can make the adjustments necessary in the ahl that wouldn't be a bad thing yeah yeah i think i agree with you i i think we will see johnny hockey in a calgary flames jersey this year i don't think he'll be here for the majority of the year I don't think he will start the year here. No, 
Uh, and it's more for his own benefit. It is. Like, you know, skill-wise, he if he was six feet tall, he'd probably be one of the top ten players in the NHL already. Like, he's got that kind of skill level. It's just that you're dealing with somebody that's five foot six in a man's game, and, uh, you know, you don't want him to get crunched. <laughs> what about Sam Bennett? Do you think he makes the NHL this year? The most I could see him playing is the nine-game trial period. I Physically, he, he's more of a rough-and-tumble type guy and, like, will hit people and such. And physically, he's not big enough for that yet. Like, he looks like an 18-year-old kid, not a... Uh, He's not a man yet, so to speak, physically. And because of that, I think he'd be better served getting another season in Kit- or Kingston and uh, putting on 10, 15 pounds in the off season and building his frame. Like, Monaghan, he had... Like, he's six foot three and was already kind of big anyway, so, like, he could handle the season, but Bennett's a little smaller, weighs quite a bit less, and, you know, it, it'd be better for him to get another season in, and, you know, he... I, I'm he'll with you be there. The be- yeah, he'll be the best guy in the OHL. Well, and, and I think that's year. something to look at too. Is would you rather bring in a guy who's struggling on the Flames, or would you rather bring in a you know leave a guy in the OHL who can tear it up there? And I think for a team that doesn't need him now, there's no reason we need Bennett this year in a Flames jersey. Send him back to the O. Let him tear it up. Exactly. And next year he'll be ready, and he'll be one of the top players and. He'll be contending for the Calder, and, probably. And next year, Johnny Goudreau will have a year under his belt so he can, you know, help mentor Bennett and show him the ropes when they both play together. Exactly. And there's no rush. No. Like, you can ruin players by rushing them. So why why do that? From a, a marketing perspective, I can see why the Flames would want to bring him up because fans want to see the kid. But to me, that's all the more reason to buy your preseason tickets because he'll be gone at the end of preseason. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, it, skill-wise, he's ready for the NHL. It's just physically, it's not in his best interest. No, it's not. Yeah, no, I, I would be really shocked to see him stick around for more than, like you said, the nine-game tryout. I think his best move is the OHL. He would have to tear it up and be on fire, like score five or six, seven goals in the preseason and then another five or six in the first nine games in order to stick this year. Yeah. I just, I don't see that no. personally. No, I don't either. It would be good if he did, but, <laughs> you know, I just don't see it. A couple other names to look at, some older players who I think have a, potentially have a shot at this team. Uh, one is Sven Berchi. And the other is David Wolf, who is an NHL rookie, but an older guy in of him, of himself. Do you think that Sven or David Wolf have a shot at this team? I would be somewhat shocked if Berchi didn't make the team, just because of the fact that, like, he had the point totals where he should be there, and you begin to question if he's going to be an NHL player if he doesn't really. I I find it kind of telling, and, you know, maybe I'm reading too much in the tea leaves, but I find it kind of telling that Sven's been in Calgary all summer. He's been doing a lot of promotion for the team this summer. Um, I think that's probably telling that they at least want to give him that shot. He's still a 21-year-old kid. I think he learned a lot last year by going to Abbotsford, by having to check his ego at the door and do that. And, yeah, I agree with you. I think that he definitely has a shot at this team. I think if he doesn't make the team for and stay here for the majority of the year, we have to start looking at what kind of asset do we have here. If he doesn't stick full-time, honestly, it's going to get to the point where do you trade him? And 
like what uh, the Islanders did with Niederreiter. Yeah, it it would be disappointing for sure. But if he if he does if he can't crack a Calgary Flames team that is as bad as the Flames are going to be this year, then that's bad. Yeah, and this is the last year of his deal. He's got this year left. He's at eight thirty eight thirty two point five. So about eight hundred thousand if he's in the NHL. His HL salary is seventy grand. So he can definitely be sent down. And there's a lot of teams that love a project. I mean, there's a lot of teams that if we decide he's not for us, we could probably get a, a I wouldn't say a good return, but we could get a, a healthy return for him because there's some teams that say, yeah, we can, you know, make him better. Well, look at what the Flames got gave up for Joel Colborn. That's basically what you would get a third or fourth and round I think that's pick. still a healthy return for him. Yeah, if he doesn't perform, yeah, yeah, I can see that. So yeah, I I agree with you. I think I think I would be shocked if Sven doesn't make the team this year, and if he doesn't, it's time to reevaluate Sven Berchi as a flame. Yeah, it it's really for him. It's put up or shut up. I think David Wolf is not going to make the team. Um, he may be a call up, but I see David Wolf being the the McGraden of Glens Falls. I agree, and. I don't see him necessarily be being in Adirondack for long. I could see him like if we get an injury to a bottom six forward like Bolig or McGrath or Boma, I could see him being the call up for that player. He he definitely has a lot of personality and like I do see him if he does make eventually make the Flames full time, I could see him becoming a fan favorite. But I wouldn't rush him into the NHL right now. Yeah, and from what I've seen of him, he needs some AHL seasoning. He does have some skill, though, so it's not like he's a terrible hockey player that's just there to punch people. No, I mean, last year in the Dell League with the Hamburg, he got 40 points in 48 games. So that says something. But, yeah, I, I agree with you. I think he he has some skill. He has some offensive skill. He will always be a tough guy he's not going to be as someone you put out as an as a offensive point generating forward but i think that he needs from what i've seen of him he needs some seasoning for the north american game and that's why i think he he goes to glens falls at the beginning of the year Mm -hmm. and he did score last night and his shot is actually surprisingly decent so for a fourth line type guy somebody's got to protect johnny hockey so there you go put him down there let him you know Take out the guys who run Johnny Hockey. And I'm sure that's what his job will be if Gaudreau's in uh, but or Adirondack. God, that's going to take me a long time. You know, I it. found myself this summer <laughs> calling it Abbotsford Adirondack. Like, you know, I'll, I'll say one and then I'll just automatically transition to the other and people wonder where the heck that is. But yeah, it, it's going to take some time. Um, the other reason I think David Wolf is going to go down, and this is silly, but... Brian Burke has said that all players in the NHL who are staying here long-term this year are going to wear numbers 1 through 35. David Wolf's been assigned 45. There's a sign that he's probably not sticking around. Just got to wait and see. Along with those, with that idea of the 1 to 35, a bunch of numbers of, or a bunch of players have changed numbers or decided on their Flames uniform number this year. Uh, Sven Berchi has changed from 47 to 27. I think that's number he wore in junior, didn't he? Honestly, I can't remember, but I think so. Um, Brandon Bolig, who's come in, is going to be wearing number 25. Derek England will be number 29. Jonas Hiller will don number 1. I've always liked the goaltender wearing number 1, so I'm glad to see that. David Jones wears number 19. Mason Raymond will wear 21. Uh, Tyler Watherspoon has been given number 26. So they're obviously thinking highly of him because he's in the top 35. Uh, Smeed will be changing his number this year to 15. What number did he wear last year? I think 26, but I could be mistaken. Setaguchi's going to wear 22. So a bunch of guys that have picked their numbers here or have changed numbers. Um, I think Smeed's kind of interesting because he's already on the team These changing numbers. But that does happen. Well, I think 15 was taken by Westgarth. Uh, but Smeed was here know. before Westgarth. Oh, Smeed wore three last year. Ah, uh, yes. So, Westgarth came after Smead did, I think, but... 
Um, who knows? But in his career, Ladislav Smith has worn five for Edmonton and three for Calgary. So maybe with five being taken, you know, throw the one in front of the five and go that way. These guys are all superstitious about their numbers, so maybe that's why he's going to be wearing 15. But not that there's any anything to talk about or debate over these numbers. Just wanted to let people know that those numbers have changed. Um, and, yeah, expect to see some players. If you see a number 15 scanning around on the blue line, you know that it's not some new call-up. So, Matt, going into training camp, we'll talk more next week once training camp has started, but is there anything going into training camp that we haven't already talked about that you want to chat about? Uh, not really. Just very much looking forward to seeing all the new faces and seeing which of the young players step their game up and if there are any surprises. Yeah, no, I agree with you. I think one thing that I really like going into training camp this year is that we were also disappointed when Troy Ward got released by the Flames last year. And I think Ryan Hushka's come in and really taken up the mantle of what the Flames wanted of a guy who's running the same system as Bob Hartley. So I'm really looking forward to Bob Hartley running training camp and these kids then being able to take that same knowledge and play almost the same type of game in Glens Falls. Yeah, and having a, one of the things that I was actually impressed by um, in, during the Penticton tournament was the composure of Huska during, especially during that ed, penalty-filled Edmonton game, because some of those penalties were quite questionable. And you know, if I was the coach, I would have been a little bit yeah. teed off. <laughs> so his composure there was quite good. And you need a steadying force on behind the bench, and he seemed to have that. So that's good. And from what I understand. I mean, I'm not an insider with the team, but from what I understand, from what I've read and people I've talked to, he's more open to working with Bob and doing things Bob's way, as opposed to, I'm the development coach, this is the way I want to do it. And that's probably why Troy Ward got let go. Yeah. So to me, that's great. If you've got a guy who, I mean, he has to put his own spin on things. We don't want him to just clone Bob Hartley, but playing the same system, using the same language, doing the same basic drills so that players who move between the two rosters, which I think there's going to be a lot of this year, are familiar with what's going to happen on both sides. And especially with the Flames being a rebuilding team, we'll likely see 8 to 10 players from Adirondack come up throughout the course of the year, if not more. So having everybody on the same page will definitely help. For sure. Well, Matt, I think it's just about time to wrap it up unless there's anything else you want to chat about. Um, I do just want to end by saying we're thinking about starting a Fireside Chat Fantasy Hockey League this year. Um, there wouldn't be any money involved, but we can probably put together a little Flames prize pack for the winner. So if you're interested in that, let us know through Twitter, through Facebook. Uh, on Twitter, we're at Fireside Podcast. On Facebook, we're facebook.com slash Fireside Chat. Uh, come to our website. We'll have a thread about it on the site. But let us know how many guys are interested. If we can get 10 to 15 of you guys, we'll we'll set up a league and send out some information. So let us know if you're interested. And as training camp starts to wind down, we will talk more about that. But, Matt, I know you're in if we do a fantasy league. I'm in. I'll probably kick your ass. But, yeah, let's have some fun. Let's play together. And, you know, let's uh, see how we can do as a sea of red being our own armchair GMs. Sounds good. We'll talk to you next week, Matt, after uh, training camp is in full swing, and we'll see how the guys are doing there. Definitely looking forward to some interesting developments over the next week. For sure. Go Flames, go. Go Flames, go. Have a good one, everyone. Fireside Chat is produced and edited by Dan Stevenson. This show is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license information, visit firesidechat.ca.